Good morning, everyone. Good morning to everyone who is with us here today in person, and a very good morning to our Israeli colleagues who are joining us online. Welcome to day two of the Energy Trilateral. And we're going to start with session five on energy transmission, distribution, grids, and AI. And it is being chaired by the US co-chair for the symposium, Professor Granger Morgan, who is a professor of engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. Professor Morgan. Oh, they're not hearing. Yeah, thank you very much. And to everyone here in the room, good morning. And to our colleagues in Israel, shalom. Uh, the problem of clean energy is only half a problem. The other half is we've got to move the energy from where it's created to where it's needed. And the U.S. Department of Energy said that if the load growth is high and we want to meet the goal of decarbonizing the electricity system in 2035, we're going to have to double the capacity of the U.S. transmission system. Now, I think DPAC is probably going to argue that's not true, but uh, uh, I'm going to talk for a moment uh, to the point that maybe, it, to the extent that it is true, what do we need to do? And I'll be blunt. Given how hard it is to build new transmission in the U.S., there's no way that we're going to double the capacity of conventional AC high voltage grid in the next few decades, and I suspect the same is true across much of the rest of the world. So here are six ways to do that, which, and I'll say a word about each of them. There's a seventh issue, of course, that's not listed on this slide, which is that we could move the demand to where the, the energy is being produced. So using grid data, machine learning, and AI, it's almost certainly possible to expand the amount of energy we move through existing transmission systems by reconductoring and increasing the voltage of existing AC lines. We can, I mean, the amount of power that you can move to, through a line is to first order the product of the current. Recording in progress the product of the current and the voltage. And if you can increase either or both, uh, that helps. The reason for low, con uh, low sag conductors is that if you move a lot of current through a line, the line gets hot, the metal expands, the, the line uh, sags. But there are new technologies that allow you to overcome that. The US lags behind the EU in the use of modern DC cables. There's a lot of modern DC cables being used in the North Sea, and there's an opportunity for us to learn a bit more from uh, the EU in that respect. You can convert existing high voltage AC lines to high voltage DC. Uh, Germany's actually doing that in one of the north-south lines, bringing power from up north down to the south. And uh, uh, you can sometimes get as much as three times as much uh, energy moved through a corridor by doing this. This is a manuscript that uh, one of my doctoral students uh, did a few years ago. And then HVDC underground uh, through non-conventional rights of way is another possibility. I said the, the EU was well ahead of the US in terms of the use of HVDC cables, but this is a project that's absolutely under construction right now that's bringing power from Quebec down to New York City by burying cables under Lake Champlain and then making a run over and burying cables under the Hudson River. Uh, and then lastly, of course, if I can't move the electricity, I may be able to make hydrogen or, or, or something else and move it. So the speakers, I think, in this session, unless it's changed, <laughs> are are here. I'm not, uh, it, so as not to chew up anybody's time, we can look up each other's uh, bios on the, on the web. And uh, so I turn the, you're the first speaker, and I turn it over to you, and I, presumably, the slides will show up. <laughs> okay. So good morning, everyone. I'm 
very happy to be here and I saw a lot of people come from here yesterday late in the evening in the hotel. I hope everyone is fit and therefore I'm really glad that I'm the first. So start with stability of hybrid ACDC systems. So Granger, thank you for the introduction because this is also what I would like to talk about. It is the transmission network. Martin, finally, as the last speaker here within the session, he will talk more about the distribution network. So we all saw yesterday the key figures from the German Energiewende, the numbers which we would like to reach. We want to be greenhouse neutral in 2045, and we want to phase out of the coal-fired power plants and the nuclear power plants. You see here the timeline. That is what you already know, so what is new? I want to come out with this figure, what it does mean for our renewable energies. You see three bars, one for each year from 2022 to 2045. And you see the offshore wind, you see the onshore wind, you see the photovoltaics, the electromobility, and the, elect the number or the rating of the electrolyzers, which we need. And then you see that if we want to reach the goals, that we have a high rate which we need for the renewables. And my intention, of course, is always to say, if we need renewables, then we also need the infrastructure to bring the energy to the customers. Because that, what I, you do not need to know the numbers. It is just the increase uh, that is very important. And here you see the line. This is the maximum load within Germany. So I want to put the focus on the flexibility which we need. Yesterday we discussed it as storage, but I always call it flexibility because it might be storage, it might also be a coupling with other energy sectors. And then imagine we have the year 2045, the sun is shining, and we have 400 gigawatt installed PV, but we only need less than 80 gigawatt. So what to do with the rest? How to transmit? How flexible do we have to be? This is the power system we search for. That we have another fact which is hidden somewhere here in the slide. I would like to focus your view on the number 750 terawatt hours. This is what we assume to have within 2030, and this is more than we have today because nowadays we have around 600 terawatt hours, so it is already an increase due to electromobility or heat pumps, two of the main reasons. So this is our task. But now we have the um, renewable energies, now I put some, the, the engineering point of view on that one. What does that mean? The first point is where do we have the renewables? Someone within Germany, they stated it is all distributed somewhere on the roofs, but this is only one part of the truth, because we also have off-consumer generation, high amount of offshore wind farms, hydropower within the Alps or within Scandinavia. So we also need the transmission lines. This is where I often have um, talks for the public to really explain, yes, we need the transmission line, we cannot avoid them. The other fact is how is it integrated or how is it provided. And then we already discussed the fluctuating generation, so it is not constant, and we need a constant infeed, or no, we need a balance between infeed and loading. That is what we need every moment, and that is what we have to manage within the new network. And of course, I do not know whether you believe in the weather forecast. I do not really believe in it. But we need it, of course, if we want to have our power system operating with it, with PV, so with the sun and with the wind. So we have there something which, uh, which we do not really know in advance. And of course, the load forecast is also just an assumption. This is also not fixed. And the third point, I would say this is one of the major aspects of my research. We exchanged the generation units. We do not have our synchronous machines with big shafts, a, little, a lot of inertia within the network. We have now power electronics, and power electronics is very, very fast. So somehow we have to change the principle of our network. So what is my conclusion from the renewables within the network? So we need flexibilities and storages to balance the fluctuation. This is one big point. And the second point is 
that our network, it will be faster due to the missing inertia. We have to react uh, faster or different. This is what we do not know at the moment. So somehow we get faster at the moment, but it might be that we want to behave different. And then you, you see it is weaker, the network. What does it mean? It is not so stiff within the voltages because that what is missing within the transmission network, these are our big generators, our big power plants, and they do not only have the task to put power into the network, they also have the task to put the voltage at the right place to keep the voltage, and it is missing. We need something different, so the network is weaker. What does that mean for the transmission grid? Um, I decided to have the first point, which is the biggest point, and you already mentioned it, the acceptance. Do we get the permission from the people to have new transmission lines? This is somehow hindering, of course, that we can expand the network as we would like to do it. We discuss a lot overhead lines and cables, AC or DC, and somehow in Germany it is decided, so we skip over to DC cables. So that is what we erect. And you will, I will fix the number, how much it is. The required speed of expansion. It takes a lot of time to get the permissions and to erect the overhead lines, and we saw that we want to be ready in 2045. So we have the speed and we need it. We want to have the renewables where they are um, um, available, so offshore wind, and then we have to bring it to the customer. But it is not really decided whether we put it as electricity or do we now have the chance to have hydrogen so to avoid that one. I guess we discussed that already yesterday a little. The system stability, um, this is one of the major concerns. Of course, it is my research topic. I have to name it like this. But we shouldn't forget, we should not only complain, because that what we also have is now, we have the power electronics, we have digitalization, so we are faster. We can manage faster. So this is a degree of freedom which we nowadays have, and we could change our principles. So we uh, just think about uh, there might be a fault within the network, and we could manage the situation in advance, preventive, so we just know if something fails, we have enough reserve within the network. Nowadays, we could be faster and we say no. If the fault re occurs, then we will react on that one. We are fast enough. This would be very, very new for us. Optimized grid operation, if we have a degree of freedom, we can control power flow, then we somehow can control losses. So we can avoid congestions, we can utilize the network in a better way. Because nowadays we have our physical laws, we always make jokes on that one, and they are still valid, our Kirchhoff law, according to the impedances, but now we have a control and we can manage. And this is different. Um, here on the right side, you see that it entered. We cannot do without a long distance power transmission. This is just to keep clear, we need the transmission network. No, we cannot do everything locally. This is one of the major sentences which I have within every talk. Now, come back to Germany. You see here the map of Germany, and we entered um, in this design the number of HVDC connections. And that uh, what you see is we have to extend the network, not only AC, but also HVDC. And what is new, it is called embedded HVDC because it is an HVDC connection which, which is within the network. It is not connecting two networks. It is just in the network. And this is rather new for these big extensions because look what we have to do. We have 20 point-to-point -point HVDC pro projects. Point-to-point -point means feed it in and put it out somewhere else. We want to go, I called the talk AC-DC um, um, grid, because we want to have a DC grid. So extend it so that we really also have an overlaid DC grid. But we also have 99 HVAC projects, which of course are not within the map, and offshore 21 point-to-point -point HVDC projects. This is just the number of the projects, but look on the number of the line lengths, which is indicated within the table. So we have an existing uh, transmission network with uh, uh, yeah, about 40,000 kilometers. And that what our plans nowadays is that we have, it is not doubled, but more than 50% which we need additionally. And now think about whether 
how realistic is it to get the permissions in time? And offshore is the, uh, the other task. I do not focus the talk today on the offshore networks, but you can imagine that if we want to have all those power 70 gigawatt connected, then this is, again, a big, big task, which is not here within the slides. I talked a lot, a lot about HVDC, and I know a lot of experts here, but let's see what is an HVDC. An HVDC is that we come from our three-phase system with 50 hertz, so a frequency. We have a converter. We convert it into DC, so we, do the, we have the frequency zero hertz, and then afterwards, then we have the long transmission, and then we put it back to the three-phase in 50 hertz, again, a converter. And this is the, what we call the power electronic converters, and this is what we already mentioned, or what Granger mentioned in his talk that he said, it is VSC technology. A little bit closer, that the mo most of the pro projects which we saw have a voltage of plus minus 525 kV, a rating of two gigawatt, and the connection, the converter technology is, are self-commutated converters. This, this was, would take at least 90 minutes to explain what it is, and, but this is the possibility. Look on the right side, there you see the characteristics which are dominated by the converter technology. So we have a lot of freedom to keep stability, and we have here a lot of stability, different terms of stability, so voltage, transient stability, frequency stability, but that what, the, what is really typical for the converter technology which we take here is that we can manage black start. So there is nothing around, but the HVDC starts the operation so we can start building islands with this technology. Uh, we need something special, but this is too detailed, but it might be able to do so. And we here within Germany, we experienced that we had more system splits in the past, so it looks like an increasing numbers, and of course it feels good to be prepared on events like this and to have something which you can start with. The DC cables, you said, yes, there's one connection where we converted HVAC to HVDC. Yes, that's true, this is one, but that what I uh, speak about here is all the others. <laughs> so it is DC cables. Here are, is the different are the different controls. I do not want to go into the details. It is just to say that what we do is, here we have the power electronics converter, and with the converter, we can control the behavior, the characteristics of those um, connections within the network. That is what we are doing. What are we doing? Here we have the challenges again. We have the fluctuating in-feed, we have small time constants, so this, uh, the faster network is indicated here. We have off-consumer generation, everything I mentioned already, the weak grid here with, with, a, with a line, um, the close line indicated, and we have control. So what to research? Yeah, a lot of things. Of course, you have to start with the modeling and the simulation, which is here at the second place. So how to model everything what you have there? Because we have those smaller time constants. We were not used to that one in such a big scaling. So this is different nowadays. And stability, we have new definitions of stability because we have a lot of new time constants, and then you have a lot of possibilities of new interactions. Flexibility is due to that is, is fluctuating, so how do we manage our network to have the balance? And of course, um, if, there, if it is so difficult to get permission, then of course it is our interest to have that, the equipment which is already installed with a higher utilization. That is for clear. And always the question, how do we manage the complexity? So it is not done with that we control a battery. We have several of batteries, and how do they interact? Here are now some research projects. You see on the right side, this is indicating an AC network where you have the generators, they are marked round, and then you have the converters, which are marked with rectangulars, and you see that we already integrated a DC grid. This is indicated in the bottom right. This is a DC network, and we said, okay, what is our motivation for our research? Yes, we want to use the degree of freedom and improve the network behavior. It doesn't matter whether it is steady state or whether it is a dynamic behavior, so during faults. 
And I marked that one in green, which I would like to present, but in a way that hopefully you understand what is our intention for the research. So um, we have to develop the control. So how does it work, the network? We have freedoms and now find the best choice to have a well-working network. Uh, but how do we find the parameters for the controls? A lot of freedom, a lot of possibilities. It could take a long time and that we have to manage. And then the last one in green, which I would like to focus, is um, the voltage stability during and after network falls. This is probably here, shown here in this way. You see a short circuit in the network, and if you just go down, then see, you see that at this node, the voltage is down to zero. So it is not possible to inject any power into the network at this place. That what you see here is a fossil, so you see it from the western part to the eastern part, and you see uh, the more you leave the short circuit place, the higher the voltage will stay. I think this is quite clear. But you see three different graphs, why? Because we improve the voltage support. The voltage support which is possible with our DC network. So we take the DC network to improve the voltage characteristics during the fault and this somehow is also the choice how we erect the network itself because then we not have to know the places where it is the most effective to put the converters to. Okay, so this is one of the examples. The other example here, you do not have to read the, te the text if you follow the tone, I, I guess this is more, <laughs> it is the better choice. So that what you see here is also a network and you see hopefully that it is indicating that we have a power flow from the north to the southern part. We have a DC transport, PDC, and we also have it in the um, surrounding AC network. We do not transmit everything via the DC network. And one question which is always asked, what happens if one of the converter fails? You see it indicated here with the X with the form. So one of the converters fails. We need a control, and the control has to manage that we have still some power within the DC network, but also within the AC network. But we detected if we put everything to the AC network, then we have a very, very rough behavior of the network. Then it might be that everything fails, so we should keep it within the DC network. So one of our tasks is, what is now the control algorithm? And that is indicated here. You see constant line, and so can, do we control the voltage or do we control the, uh, the power? It doesn't matter because it is too detailed but with the experts. I, we can discuss this afterwards, but I think for all of the people, they are more interested in the results. Because the results are here indicated for the outage at off converter four, we concentrate on the orange part, and then you see that we have a standard control in red, that what happens normally with a normal control, and that what we manage with a new control. And that uh, you see the delta on the x axis, and that what you see is, yes, converter four loses the, the, the power. This is the big bar which you see over there. With the blue control, we see now that what we managed is, yes, blue takes over, the number two takes over. So we keep still the power in the DC network, now not distributed to the western part and the eastern part. It takes the, uh, the road to the western part, to the number two, and the rest is not influenced yeah, quite, uh, you, can, you can rather see a change. And that means that we do not skip it to the AC network, so we have the, um, the fault more locally. And this is a good choice because you do not influence and you do not have the interaction with the generator units because this is what we want to avoid. Another question, so um, imagine you have to put parameters to the controls. We said we have 20 converters, 20 controls. Every con control has, here in this case, 15 parameters. How to find them? And this is a method which we found within the literature and which we improved. You see it in the bottom. So uh, on the top you see, oh, it's very complicated. If you have the impression then I reached the goal. Yes, it is very impressive. And then that what we have, we have the result, the original results, which is in blue. It is somehow oscillating and we have to find this solution. We found in literature um, the result for the red line. 
yeah, it is not oscillating, but it is far away. And that what we managed is with a different type of tuning that we found the green line, and no, it is not oscillating, and it is closer by. And that what we took, we, we used the modes of the system, the eigenvalues, and this is one of um, the special tuning algorithm which we have over there, and this is what we wanted to reach. So we have a lot of degree of freedom, and we have to find a way how to use it. So this should be the message. And the next point, again, I will put you through the slide. <laughs> it is, if we have smaller time constants, in the past we knew how we have to model our devices. We knew, ah, there is something which is quite slow, and then we have a simplified modeling art, which we call the RMS modeling, and if we have to go into the detail, then we have the EMT, then we have all the time constants in. What is now the drawback? If we have a lot of very small time constants, we are not able any longer to have it within the EMT modeling because it is too slow. I am a long time within the business of um, simulating modeling and always the computers are too slow. This time they are so fast already, but the time constants, we need a lot of for, for modeling. So we found a way where we say we combine both modelings and if something is happening within the network, then we switch to the fast simulation method, and it, if everything is okay, then we stay within the slow modeling art. So this is what we are doing here, and we improve the exchange of data, and exchange of data takes time. So this is, we improve the simulating of our complex system, because this is what you always need. So now I'm back with a, a summary and I hope you somehow got with you that, that what happens within the power system is just not integrating renewables. We call it a paradigm shift because it is a different network which we need afterwards. We need the expansion of the transmission grid and we need HVDC to realize that one in Germany and we call that one embedded HVDC. And our research is that we do not want to stay with those point-to-point -point con connections. We want to have a DC grid, which is also operating um, um, yeah, in parallel to the AC grid. That's all for today. You are still awake. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I think everybody sat through uh, a number of presentations yesterday and, uh, you know, Thanks, Jita, for, uh, for getting us started on this. Uh, I'm going to kind of uh, spend some time framing the problem because I don't think we have actually framed the problem properly so far. So let me just, uh, you know, start with that. <coughs> just a very quick uh, introduction for uh, what the work that we do. I'm at uh, Georgia Tech Center for Distributed Energy. And I think we have a very uh, strong focus on creating not point solutions, but really holistic solutions that, are, that kind of solve the entire problem, but which also can be rapidly adopted and scaled. That really distinguishes, I think, the approach that uh, we try to take. Uh, the focus is digitalization, decentralization, decarbonization, uh, and there are four, uh, four companies that uh, have spun off from what we're doing as an example of solutions that are actually being deployed on the grid and actually making uh, uh, a difference, we hope. Um, so let's start with uh, what, what we actually are seeing. We see a massive disruption, I think, uh, to echo the point. Uh, this disruption, every customer is at the edge of the grid. And so I, I would say that uh, the disruption experience is going to be more at the edge of the grid. And the things that we see are things we've talked about. You know, PV and wind is growing at phenomenal pace. You know, hundreds of gigawatts a year are being deployed right now. Uh, we are trying to integrate with storage so you have better dispatchability. Uh, we see storage is growing by itself. We see hydrogen is, uh, grow, you know, growing very, very rapidly. Each of these numbers is thousands of gigawatts of, uh, of deployment that we're talking about. Then we have uh, electrification of transportation and eventually everything. That's also thousands of gigawatts uh, out there uh, that we're talking about. If you look at fast charging just itself, you know, if you look at 125 million EVs, which is the midpoint estimate for the, for the US, uh, you know, that 8% you know, of them charging at a time is 1,000 gigawatts of peak load which is the total U.S. generation capacity, so no way that that's going to uh, easily happen. In addition, we're talking about, uh, you know, microgrids and resiliency, so a whole bunch of things, everybody acting very fast, moving very, very uh, quickly, all connecting with the uh, grid, but all completely outside of utility control. 
Okay, and, and therein lies part of the problem, right? So this is an irreversible energy transition. We're seeing very fast growth within each of the silos. Uh, there's no coordination whatsoever between them, and they all connect to the grid. Best of luck. Okay, so, but what is causing the disruption? Why is this disruption suddenly occurring? Uh, so Granger uh, and I and uh, Jeff, were, we were on this uh, committee, uh, and uh, uh, Terry Boston, who was the ex-CEO of uh, PJM, the largest grid operator in the world, he said, in 2010, there was not a single CEO of uh, a uh, grid operator, a utility, or automobile com you know, manufacturing company who thought that you know, solar, batteries, or EVs were real. Just 2010. Mm -hmm. How the hell did 10 years make such a huge difference that the whole world has completely changed, right? This is really, we feel, because of these steep and sustained learning rates that we are, are seeing for some of these technologies. If you look at the, uh, the uh, curve on the uh, second from left, uh, that's the curve for solar. Uh, it's been going on for 60 years now with a 23% learning rate. The curve to the right of that is the curve for batteries, and that's been going on uh, you know, very significant uh, you know, learning rate. Uh, and the curve on the left is the curve for uh, semiconductors, power semiconductors, and that's going at the same kind of rate. No wonder when all these things intersect, you see the price of solar go from $850 a kilowatt hour uh, in 2000 to $22 a kilowatt hour in 2022. There's no way that you could have forecast that. Uh, and the same thing is happening with batteries. So, so we see you know, a massive change that's being driven by lower costs that are, are really coming. And we have this tendency to stop the clock and say, okay, the cost is low, now let's design the next 20 years. But guess what, in the next 20 years, the cost is going to be you know, down to 10% of what it is today. And what is your business model that is taking care of that? And, and if it isn't, then it's a problem. We, what has also you know, made this happen are what I would call forward-leaning policies, you know, like the, uh, the German uh, feed and tariff program, which intersected with Chinese growth of manufacturing capability to really start this whole transformation going. And now there is, there's absolutely uh, you know, no going back. You know, we see, I mean, the DOE projection itself of solar is 1,000 gigawatts by 2035. Okay, and uh, we talked to Jennifer Granholm, and she was saying 3,000 gigawatts in, you know, eventually by the time it's all done. I mean, that's a massive you know, amount of, uh, you know, of, uh, of an added uh, uh, generation that's going to be coming on the grid. This transformation is irreversible, but our actions will determine the trajectory. And it could be really problematic, it could be really chaotic if we don't get our act together. And this is, I think, a fundamental thing that uh, I want to kind of uh, talk a little bit uh, about. So, so what it says is that, okay, let's take a look at the picture on the left. You know, we have essentially, uh, you know, all these areas that are growing very, very quickly. So PV solar is growing at about 34% year over year, energy storage is about 30%, and uh, vehicles are going 60%, and they all connect to the grid, and the grid is going at 0.25%. Okay, and there is a, a fundamental problem, uh, you know, that, uh, that comes from that. So if I now take a look at the bulk generation on the left in the lower picture, and I, and I look at uh, how the loads are, are today, okay, you have residential, commercial, industrial, some transportation starting to, uh, to show up, some distributed generation rooftop solar, but not a lot, and we rely on the transmission network to ship power from the left to the right, and the distribution network to distribute uh, everything. Now let's take a look at 2040, a few years uh, you know, hence. We find that on the left, you've added another 1,000 gigawatts, no, 2,000 gigawatts of generation, okay? Uh, and uh, all these new loads, you know, transportation has grown, EVs have grown, uh, industrialization uh, is shifting to electrification, and they all need, uh, need generation. Where are you going to get that from? There is no way, and we, we start to see that tendency already. We started to see that you know, fleet operators, data center operators, they're all starting to put local generation to feed their loads because they're commercial. They're putting their loads in. They need power. They can't wait for the utility to provide it, so they're building their own generation out there. Okay, plus if I now build a lot of new transmission to connect really poor capacity generation, my utilization is gonna get much worse. So the justification, the economic justification is starting to get poorer as well. And we started to see that reflected back in the actions that people are taking, the investors are taking uh, to do that. So we see that there's a big challenge here in serving new loads uh, to connect these bulk resources. Uh, and this is forcing a rapid growth of distributed generation uh, you know, that uh, is, is, is coming on the, uh, on, on the right side out here. So, okay, so we see a grid that is under stress. In the U.S., it's reflected very clearly, uh, you know, by 950 gigawatts that are sitting in the interconnection queue right now, okay? And that number is increasing, so that's a problem. Uh, but EPRI and the utilities have committed to a 50% uh, decarbonization by 2030 and 100% by 2050. That's great. 
let's, let's clap. But I don't see a pathway to getting there. Okay, there's no, no reasonable uh, you know, scope. I mean, for example, the, uh, the, the $1 trillion infrastructure bill that was passed had $2.5 billion for transmission. Sounds like a lot. We need about $360 billion. So that's a big, big shortfall. And, you know, and, and NIMBY says you know, you're not going to be able to build all that transmission very easily. So therein lies a the problem. Well, <clears throat> we continue to deploy solar on the grid like crazy. I say that pure PV is the enemy of the grid because it's generating you know, energy where it wants to and when it wants to, and energy is needed somewhere else, you know, and you know, how the hell are you going to connect all these things together? So we're starting to see curtailment already starting to show up, which trashes the business model for the, uh, the solar guys. You know, and now what do you do? I mean, so this is the kind of stuff that is going on all over the place uh, you know, at this point in time. The other thing that we see is that the, 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 the model for control on the grid today is completely centralized, you know, and, uh, you know, a lot of our work is done, you know, with the assumption that you have full knowledge of everything, you can dispatch the commands and everything else, and now as we start seeing this growth of millions of inverters, we don't really know how the hell to manage uh, these, uh, you know, very easily. Uh, you know, the future grid, uh, we're going to lose synchronous generation, so you're going to need more inertial support, but sometimes you need high inertia, sometimes you need low inertia. You need dynamic balancing, you need grid forming, damping, stabilization, all of these things with a dispersed uh, inverter resources. Uh, so. so this is the problem. And then what compounds the problem is the regulated, that the industry itself is highly regulated, okay? which means their you know, goal in life is to provide affordable, reliable uh, you know, power and universal power. And none of these three you know, kind of match what, they want, what you want to do. So when you start putting a lot of new solar on the system, the reliability goes down. So guess what? They fight it. You know, regulations don't allow that to happen very easily. Uh, and, uh, you know, when you allow just industry to take this out, it, it is not very just and equitable. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of things that we need to really kind of uh, figure out. And that kind of tells you that this is a massive disruption uh, that is, uh, is underway. Uh, you know, and uh, can this be economical? Can it be low risk and fast to scale? And can it be resilient, resilient and equitable? And, you know, unfortunately, history suggests that this is not so easy to do. You know, and, uh, you know, so this is kind of the, uh, uh, the problem that we're facing. Uh, I think we, we talked about the fact that this new grid that we need now uh, and, and the new uh, resources we need need a lot more dynamic control, and this dynamic control comes from power electronics, uh, you know, centralized, di distributed, massively distributed at the grid edge. And, you know, we've been building inverters for 50 years now, so where is the problem? Why is there a problem at all? Every inverter we build up till now is a device, and it needs to do what it needs to do for its customer, okay? We are now starting to build devices that are going to be sitting on the grid, and they all interact with each other. Okay, so far we've thought about the grid as a resource. That means I build a PV plant, the grid is there, it takes as much energy as I want to give it. I build a charging plant or a, a, you know, hydrogen generation, I connect to the grid, it gives me what, well, guess what, it doesn't, right? And so somehow this whole thing needs to be coordinated uh, and we started to see big problems started to come in, uh, in systems where you have high inverter penetration. Uh, we are seeing that stability problems are there. We had a conversation with one of the, uh, the grid operators in, the U, uh, in, the, in, in Europe, one of the largest grid operators, and they're saying that they can't even get a system with five inverters to stay stable. Okay, therein lies a very fundamental problem uh, that, uh, that we really need to, uh, to, to tackle. So what does this new grid look like? So, you know, it's a new paradigm, okay? Uh, on the left, uh, you see a, uh, you know, the existing grid, it's large synchronous gen you know, generators all connected together. You know, there's nothing smart about that. It's just a passive mechanical grid. Okay, and it's been working for a very long time. We solved the problem of how to make that stable, you know, some time back, thank God we did. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, and then it sits 15 minutes away from uh, a system operator who's doing optimization and, and giving dispatch commands. That's where the smarts are, not in the grid itself. We are moving from that to a decentralized active grid where you now have inverters with, uh, with intelligence sitting there, very fast response cap capability sitting out there that are able to take action. So we're going from a linear time invariant system where you are able to model it reasonably well and control it well to a highly nonlinear system where uh, all my inverter controls tend to be highly nonlinear. Uh, you know, and you talk about machine intelligence, you can put all of that uh, in, into it, but now the behavior is not very predictable. Plus, each of these is manufactured by a different vendor who wants to keep his black box completely proprietary and not share that across uh, anybody else. Okay, so how the hell do they not interact with each other? There becomes a really uh, fundamental problem that, uh, you know, that we'd, we'd be trying to kind of, uh, uh, you know, figure out how, to, uh, how to, to handle this. The same thing happened on the main grid. 
okay? Because uh, in the early 1900s, it was like the Wild West. You know, everybody was doing whatever they wanted to do, and nothing was being coordinated. So in 1904, there was a meeting that was held in St. Louis, organized by the IEEE, okay, where all these engineers uh, came together and said, hey, we need to figure out what to do out here. Uh, and the rules of droop and all started coming from there. You know, standardization of frequency and voltages and protection all started coming from there. And that's how we got going. But today, the challenge is that we have to figure out how to scale the centralized paradigm to an IBR-rich system where we have millions of inverters operating autonomously with poor system visibility and knowledge without latency, uh, in low, low latency communications, uh, and how do you maintain cyber secure real-time must run capability under all conditions? This is a really big, uh, big problem. How do you ensure that this fast evolving multi-IBR, multi-vendor grid uh, is, uh, is well behaved and stable at scale? not only under normal conditions, but also under transient uh, and fault, you know, fault conditions. So this is a fundamental problem. I'll give you an example why the paradigm shift is so fundamental. You know, every power system person will tell you that the most important you know, parameter in the grid is the frequency, because we regulate everything against that, we do power sharing against that, and, you know, and this, is, this is, uh, is fantastic. Well, we had a, you know, a, a group uh, sitting there talking, you know, control guys, and I asked the question, what is frequency? After three hours, we were still figuring out what frequency was. And because now what happens is when you have a lot of you know, inverter-based resources that are, that are responding to local uh, disturbances and local frequency measurements, as power changes in the system, your angle changes, so your dynamic frequency measurement changes, so each one is responding to what it thinks the frequency is, and it's different. And then we wonder about why they interact with each other and can't can't stay stable. So this is a real big, big problem in terms of the paradigm. Uh, and uh, we see this all over the place. I mean, we see that, you know, today's answer to, uh, to a stable operating system is infinite knowledge of the system, infinite knowledge of every parameter, the ability to model everything in the world. Uh, and we find that we still can't keep the damn thing stable. Okay, here's some examples of, uh, you know, a system that's working reasonably well, just, multi, you know, just a couple of inverters. Uh, and then, they, you know, the, the line, uh, one line changes and the system goes unstable, okay? And there's no notification you have, so you, ha you can retune the system at that point to make it stable, but that's not a practical solution. So how do you make this you know, practically implementable, okay? Uh, we talked about grid-forming inverters. Now, once you lose synchronous generators, these inverters need to have grid-forming capability. Well, what the hell does that even mean? Now, many companies say, I have grid-forming capability. Well, it doesn't really, we don't have a good definition of that uh, at this point in time. But one thing is clear, if you only have grid-following inverters, then as your penetration uh, level of inverters increases, the system goes unstable, okay? So there needs to be some IBR penetration. But there is, again, these things are not very well understood. And then even on the main grid right now, we see, you know, when you have inverters on the system, we start seeing you know, unpredictable behavior that has really started to become uh, problematic. And this is, you know, millions of grid-connected inverters, how do you control them at scale? Seems to be an intractable problem, but that's not stopping us from rolling gigawatts of uh, inverters out on every grid that we can imagine, and that pace is only, uh, only accelerating. Uh, the DOE has uh, funded a consortium called Unify, uh, and uh, you'll see that picture looks like the other one, uh, you know. <laughs> intentionally, but uh, this was at Georgia Tech. Uh, so we are, we, are, we are really kind of uh, trying to understand how do you, uh, you know, design and build inverters at any scale, okay, that will be able to work with uh, any mix of uh, inverters and generators. Uh, and uh, I think that that's, but it's, you know, it's going to take some time to get it done. Now, can this all be done? I mean, so here's an example of, uh, you know, sorry for the waveforms, but, you know, I just started uh, throwing a couple of these. <laughs> So we, we've been kind of looking at inverters. The whole point out here is a new paradigm. We want to kind of go from absolute knowledge of the system to following rules. If we can set up rules that allow these things to interact with, uh, with each other, okay, then you can go towards what I'm calling universal uh, control. Uh, and what this is, uh, you know, we want to do is be able to connect as many inverters as we want, connect them and disconnect them at will, uh, automatically operate in either grid connected or grid islanded mode, with no topology knowledge and no information on anything, be able to provide grid support as needed, uh, including damping, inertia, uh, suppressed interactions, all of that stuff, uh, be able to form microgrid clusters automatically that coalesce together and, and, uh, and separate out, uh, and do it so that multiple vendors can implement this. 
Okay, so this is the, the real challenge, okay, not being able to solve one little thing at, uh, you know, at a time. And we have been able to do that with uh, a very interesting construct where we are actually kind of, uh, uh, the, the problem definition is really done through rules and it's done in a kind of a parallel construct. And we, we'll be showing for a small system here that you can pretty much put any, any disturbance on it uh, and uh, it is able to, uh, to manage it. So this is a decentralized ad hoc fractal microgrid concept that we've been able to demonstrate. So if we are beginning to see solutions, even if we could get everything right today, okay, what would happen? Why can't we do standards? I mean, standards are how this whole industry operates. If you look at that standard process you know, for inverters, everything is a backward-looking process because when big trouble keeps happening, then you say, I need a standard for that. Okay, and uh, you know, there's a delay of literally 10 to 12, 15 years between the identification of problem and the standard you know, is implemented at scale and, and starts uh, you know, uh, being available. So even if we had the solution today, we would see that by the time that solution was deployed and available at scale, another 12 years would have gone by, which means that you'd have another 750 gigawatts of non-compliant inverters already connected on the grid. So this is a problem that nobody really talks about. Everybody just thinks that this will automatically take care of uh, itself, uh, and, uh, and, it, and it really won't. So there's a need for an, an, an interim solution, okay, that can be easily deployed uh, and which will actually uh, be able to help stabilize the grid while all these other solutions are being, uh, being developed. We have, uh, been we have proposed one, and we've been working with some uh, major companies to take existing you know, uh, medium voltage converters and drives and be able to attach it to existing transformers to form what we, to, you, to create what we call a grid former uh, concept where you can actually provide grid forming capability on the grid uh, and you can provide damping, both series and shunt damping to be able to stabilize the system. So this is an example uh, of a, a lower risk cost effective solution that uh, can scale to both distribution and transmission levels. Um, so at the end of this, I want to kind of raise uh, a flag and say that what we are really heading towards is complexity. And you don't solve complexity by absolute knowledge, because if you try that, the system is very fragile. And uh, you know, the smallest piece of uh, bad information can bring the whole thing crashing down. So we've been looking at what we call this co concept of collaborative control, uh, where these devices collaborate with each other you know, based on rules that you have. And you say, that can't be done. Well, that's an example. We do this all the time. So if you look at that traffic uh, you know, photograph, you know, uh, we all drive as intelligent agents. We sit in a car that has general rules you know, uh, designed to. There's a lot of IP that's proprietary. And we, based on local information, we are able to drive uh, and by following rules are able to kind of fulfill all our, our, our objective requirements. We think that that is a better model you know, for being able to build these large complex systems which are more decentralized uh, and, uh, uh, and where you can actually do, take action to disconnect uh, things uh, you know, like that. Uh, so these systems need to operate with core system knowledge, need to have flexible system goals uh, and be able to adapt to varying uh, resource conditions. Sounds a lot like what we do in real life. You know, and I think when you build these systems, I think that's kind of where we are, uh, are likely to end up. So these are kind of an ecosystem concept. It's a collaborative self-organizing uh, system that uh, you know, can achieve uh, local and, uh, and owner objectives. Seems to be uh, no real way to do this, but we've implemented this in multiple cases. One, uh, Verintech on the right is actually in, uh, in production for a long time now. Uh, these are completely decentralized uh, control concepts where we are doing volt bar compensation uh, on, on feeders. Uh, this is actual data from a feeder with 100 units all collaborating together to, to create voltage profiles. We've also worked on this, uh, you know, a, a, a transactive a physical control layer where we marry economics with the physics of the operation you know, to come up with uh, you know, mechanisms that can help stabilize the grid across a very wide range of operating conditions. Uh, we are also kind of uh, stay, you know, taking that to the next level and saying, what I really want, you know, I, I, I believe in magic wands. I said, I always tell my students, if I can wave a magic wand, what would I want it to do? Okay, and if I can't describe that and I have to use a equation, then I'm not succeeding out here, right? So here I think the whole idea is if I can create this plug and play module that I can just stack together so my, my grandma could come and operate the system, I want the PhD inside the box, not outside the box, right? If you can do that, you know, then I think we have a system that can scale. Uh, and you know, we've been kind of looking at this kind of concept for a hut in Africa all the way to a small community to a large utility scale grid. Uh, and uh, you know, we've been developing these solutions where you can kind of integrate uh, with the panel 
full uh, storage, full inverter, full capability that you can just stack together uh, to, uh, to build all these systems. So this is what I call decentralized autonomous control of millions of inverters, and I think that is now very much, uh, very much doable. So yes, there is a paradigm shift underway. Okay, we're going from grid as a resource to grid as an ecosystem. And what I've got here is some attributes on the left of what uh, grid as a resource looks like, and on the right, what the attributes look like, and they seem to be almost opposites. And the worry I have is that if I now look at the uh, utility industry, do they really have the skill set that we need to make this transition to the right? And my big concern is that it's not there at this point in time. Uh, and uh, you know, they are in the midst of a major disruption. Most companies that are in the midst of a major disruption spend enormous amounts of R&D money uh, and have a vision of what their future is and can implement that. Uh, this industry, unfortunately, spends 0.1% of revenues on, uh, on R&D, and they don't have any of the technical capabilities, so I really worry about uh, where that is. So, so to, to finish up, Yes, there's a tremendous amount of innovation and disruption that is underway. It's driven by these steep learning curves that really can't go back, and I think we have to have different business models to look at how to manage those. Uh, grid integration of high penetration DR is a major challenge. Uh, centralized grid control is challenged at high IVR penetrations, but we don't have a model for decentralized control that really requires, uh, you know, uh, that, that works with multi-vendor geodispersed IBRs, you know, uh, and that's a problem. Uh, we have very poor intuition and understanding, you know, in the grid operator, utility, and vendor communities, and investor communities on, on what the solution uh, needs to look like, you know. Uh, so I think there's a role that the national academies have to play out here. I think it's really important. Okay, I think we really have to help raise the level of understanding where the gaps are, uh, and what industry needs to do, uh, and to ensure that we take a holistic view of the problems that uh, are there. And we've been on consensus studies, and those are not the answer necessarily. They just take too long. Uh, we think there's the need for a faster forward-looking mechanism uh, that can generate a unified view of the gaps and challenges and the ways industry and academia can solve them, and me mechanisms to accelerate science to market. So with that, thank you. Sorry it took a little bit longer, but I was, I'm hoping that the message was... I will uh, also discuss uh, the topic of power system dynamics. I will do it from a completely different approach. So uh, previous speakers uh, emphasized emphasize the complexity of the grid, and uh, I com completely agree, it's a highly complex system. Uh, I will try to argue that we need to look at uh, as simple models as possible to gain some intuition to the design of uh, such networks. Uh, my research in this field is uh, highly mathematical, but I, I try to, uh, to, to, to make it accessible for you, and I'll be fairly brief. So, of course, our practical motivation is to better understand the grid dynamics, especially in light of uh, high penetration levels of renewables and electric vehicles. This is a standard. Uh, our challenge is that the grid is super complex, and some call it the most uh, complex system man made by mankind. This is not uh, my words. Uh, and even the simplest models that we are looking at are nonlinear and of very high dimension. So in practice, and we have seen this in previous talks, that power system dynamics are studied numerically using very powerful computers and very detailed models. As you just said, we can never have enough computer power to address uh, this kind of uh, models and to, to really understand them. But uh, with great complexity, we lose the fundamental understanding of the grid. And this is uh, what I'm trying to do in this research, not me only, but a uh, whole community. Uh, we try to study simplified dynamic models analytically. And we try to, by that, gain, gain a better understanding of the, the fundamental design principles of the grid. So uh, those of you who work in this field may think that this is completely crazy because the grid is so complex. We can never find a, a dynamic model which is simple enough we can study analytically. Uh, and I completely agree. Uh, and even though this is true, we are still trying to gain some, some insight into the design and not just run endless uh, computer simulations. This is our motto or goal. So here is some open, uh, several open questions in this field. Of course, it's driven by practical questions. So uh, most fundamentally, what control mechanism should be implemented in electric machines and in power electronics-based inverters, uh, as, the, as uh, Deepak uh, mentioned? 
And can we preserve the stability of future grids? This is a major, there is a major question mark there and it's uh, not obvious. And many theoretical questions that uh, relates to the mathematical modeling. So first and foremost, what model should be used? So what uh, model is simple enough uh, to be studied and yet, yet uh, complex enough to describe the system? It's a major question. I don't think there is a good answer. Uh, can we predict the stability of equilibrium points of these models, operating points, uh, using simple enough design rules? And this is, the, this is the highlight here. So we, of course, can say in existing models if an equilibrium point is stable, but if just a, a result of a computer numeric simulation, and we'd have almost zero understanding to what it actually means. Uh, mathematically speaking, can we find Lyapunov functions? So these are potential functions that describe uh, general power system models. Uh, currently, there is no answer to that uh, theoretical question. Can we predict the region of attraction of equilibrium points or the existence of limit cycles? So these are basic concepts in uh, nonlinear uh, dynamic systems. And again, we have no complete answers to these questions. And above all, I want to emphasize the challenge of what I call the practical stability problem. So there is a gap. There is a gap today. We know that power systems today are stable systems. We see it, of course, every day they operate. But we do not understand why. There is no fundamental reason, mathematically, of course, that predicts here, take this constraint or this, uh, this condition. If this condition is met, then your system is stable. There is no, no such thing. Maybe in very, very simple systems we can do it, but in general, we cannot. So uh, if we study the system only using computer simulations, we have almost zero uh, intuitive, intuitive understanding of the system, and this is, of course, what this community is trying to gap. Uh, and I'm arguing that without such fundamental understandings, we have no guarantee that the grid will remain stable if we have a paradigm shift in the network. So what people have been doing in this area, so first uh, the community involved are mainly the power system community and the control community. And this is very old research, it's not new. Uh, I know of uh, papers at least and since the 1970s uh, and probably much earlier. Uh, recently we see a very gro growing interest in this field with uh, many new researchers joining this field, probably due to integration of uh, renewables. And there are literally thousands of papers in, the, in this uh, regime. So they use uh, Lyapunov functions of all sorts, many models, Koromuto models, and RPS models. Maybe we don't know these terms, but uh, it's fine. I'm just uh, name dropping here. Uh, linearization techniques and many, many more. It's, very, it's a very large research. I will touch uh, very briefly on the modeling problem. So the, the major question, what model is simple enough, simple enough, yet it is detailed enough? So let's see several examples of how people model uh, phenomena in power systems, dynamic phenomena, of course. So to the very left, which is the simple uh, axis, we, we see static linear models. So these are the most simple and the, therefore the most popular. So we used uh, what is called the DC power flow approximation, which is a very crude approximation to the power flow in the grid, and we neglect nearly all dynamics. Then we have the static nonlinear models. These are made, um, mainly the classic power flow algorithms that we all know of. Time varying phasor models, which uh, model the grid using phasors, reactive power, active power, things we like to talk about as engineers. Um, but they are still fairly inaccurate in a very short uh, time scales. We have DQ0 models, a, a popular transformation in power systems, which are fairly accurate, but has their own limitations. We have transient models that uh, are used by computer software simulations. These mainly work in the ABC reference frame, modeling the three-phase uh, circuit. And then we can uh, get into more and more complex models and add the power electronics device, add switching phenomena, and so forth. So the details are endless. Um, and where, where to work? This is the major question at the basis of this research. So we like to work here. This is the classic power system models. We say uh, that uh, the system is time varying, non-linear, but still can be described by phasors. 
So here is a classic, very old, very famous uh, uh, time-varying phasor model. Um, I will go uh, very briefly through the details, not to show the mathematics, ju just to show the quantities involved. So first I must say it's a, it's a highly simplified dynamic model. As you can see, I can write it with three equations, although they are uh, of high dimension, but still the, it looks very simple. We assume all generators are synchronous machines in a way, which is a very, very crude assumption, uh, especially when uh, considering um, power electronics inverters. And we describe them using the second order dynamic model, uh, which is also not, uh, not so good. Um, and the power network here has no dynamics. It's described the major, majorly by phasors, which is a set of algebraic equations. And we assume that uh, we have voltages and currents with amplitude and phase that vary in time. So what are the quantities involved? I, don't, uh, I, don't, I will not explain the model, of course. It's, uh, it's, I don't have the time. So we are modeling generator frequencies. We attach a frequency to each generator. We, atta we attach a phase to each generator. It's uh, marked here by delta. We say that phase is an integral of frequency, uh, more or less. And we, we uh, model the generator's active power which is a function of the phases. And uh, this constant M models the inertia of a generator, D marks the damping of the generator, generator or the droop control uh, constants, and F is the power network itself. So why is this model interesting? Why, why did we choose it? So it's fairly simple, as you can see, yet it is nonlinear and very highly complex. And, uh, Notice that we cannot even write the model equations in explicit form. So the problem starts with this function f, shown here uh, with uh, this red arrow. So this function f is a solution of the AC power flow equations. So these are must be solved numerically for each specific case, and uh, are the, they are the solution of a very complex uh, function, sinuses, cosine, cosine and so forth. And this uh, set of equations doesn't have an analytic solution. So we just say there is some function. We know it is continuous. We know that it is uh, differentiable. But we don't know anything more about it because we cannot write it. So the main question is how do you explore a model if you cannot even write the equations properly, right? We just know there is a function f describing the system. We don't know what it is. We cannot write it down except for very simple cases. So uh, some classic results for, uh, for this classic model. This is taken from the 1980s, uh, more or less. So for very, very simple cases, we have a Lyapunov function that can be found, uh, which uh, can be attached to this model. For instance, several simple cases uh, which, in which this applies. When we use the DC power flow approximation, again, a very crude approximation, then we can find a Lyapunov function. When all the loads are located on generators, when the generators have no rotating mass, notice this is uh, absolutely absurd, of course. Um, and in this case, we can find a Lyapunov function, and this means that every equilibrium point will be a stable one. So if we, we find an equilibrium uh, function, a Lyapunov function, this means that we found a stable equilibrium. But this is, of course, a misleading result because we know that this uh, practice, uh, in models in practice can be unstable. So we oversimplified the system and got the wrong result out, uh, out of this uh, simplification. So there is a, line, a very interesting research question here. Can we avoid oversimplification but get a result that is general enough and meaningful? This is something that uh, the community has struggled with for many, many years. And, uh, of course, the problem uh, arises from the fact that we cannot even write the model equations. There, there is no uh, closed-form analytic uh, expression that describes the power grid dynamics. Uh, and, therefore, only simple cases have been uh, studied so far. But, clearly, there is something missing because we know from experience and from practical uh, 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 simulations that these models tend to be stable. So obviously we are missing something, right? So at the one hand we are looking at models that are highly stable. At the other hand, we cannot, uh, we don't know why. We want to bridge this gap. This is uh, maybe the motivation for this research. So what is this missing link? 
can we approach the more general cases? Uh, this is something we do in my uh, research group. And I want to show you only one uh, very specific result we, we got recently, and uh, with that I will uh, conclude. Uh, so we are trying to say something about any network, any general network, not just specific networks. And we found a, a very, I think, an interesting uh, phenomenon that relates to these models, and it relates to this matrix here we called H. Uh, without the details, it's just a matrix that uh, is, has within it, its entries the partial derivatives of this unknown function f. So we can uh, compute these derivatives numerically and get one uh, matrix called H, uh, numerically of course. And we found something interesting. So with any network, doesn't matter what, uh, an equilibrium point of this model is stable if and only if, and this is the highlight, this matrix is positive definite. So this uh, matrix uh, describes the network in a way. It should only be positive definite for the network equilibrium point to be stable. And if it's not positive definite, then it is not stable. So this is a simple mathematical criteria that uh, we can apply. I want to show you why is this important. So real life power systems tend to be very sparse and therefore their matrix are primarily diagonal. So look at this matrix, which is the, taken from the IEEE case 118. So you see that uh, you mainly have proper uh, entries that are non-zero on the main diagonal and some, some uh, entries uh, outside the diagonal but mainly you have uh, entries on the main diagonal. So we know that uh, primary diagonal matrices tend to be positive definite. And what that means, it means that we found a reason, maybe a crude one, but a reason why practical power systems are stable. Okay, we'll go through it again. So power systems are sparse, primarily diagonal, matrix arises from that. Matrices the, the, tend to be positive definite, and therefore we have an explanation, a crude one at least, to why, why this system is stable. We also got a nice design criteria for renewable energy integration. So let's say we are designers, we want to uh, design a power grid with many, many inverters, and they need to work in parallel and be stable. What to do, how to approach this, this design problem? So this the result tells you, make the system sparse enough that this matrix H becomes positive definite. If you do that, at least, based on our crude modeling, then this operating point will be stable. With that, I will conclude. Thank you very much. Good morning, guten morgen, shalom. So it is my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I just want to say a few things, setting the context for my remarks, uh, because when I put my slides together, I didn't really fully appreciate the composition of who would be in the room. So just to uh, remind everybody that uh, the electric power grids um, derive their stability and reliability through their sheer immense size. Uh, for example, the, the interconnected continental European grid is the second largest grid in the world. Uh, the eastern interconnection in the U.S. is the third largest grid in the world. Uh, we also have the seventh largest grid in the world with the western interconnection, the 13th largest grid in the world with the Texas interconnection, and the 15th largest grid in the world with the Quebec interconnection comprised of the North American system. But things propagate through a synchronous grid very quickly. Uh, some things happen uh, near the speed of light with electromagnetic type of disturbances. Some things propagate uh, slower, about 1,000 kilometers per second with electromechanical uh, types of interactions. And these create, you know, we, we heard earlier about eigenvalues and, and different controller interactions from prior speakers. Uh, but fundamentally, we need good, accurate models to um, run the grid because things propagate through the system faster than we can control them. And so these computer models are used to understand the grid. They're used to do contingency analysis. I fully agree with the prior speaker that it's not a closed form um, uh, solution, but uh, you know, because there's a lot of interesting nonlinear uh, dynamics in these grids. But going through that process of contingency analysis to really understand what could happen if credible contingencies uh, could occur 
and making sure that the grid is operated in a mode so that um, we don't have an uncontrolled cascading failure if they occurred. But that depends on accuracy in these computer models. And so the real focus of my presentation is gonna be talking about advanced measurement systems that can be used to gather data from the grid when disturbances occur, and that can be used to enhance the accuracy of these uh, computer models that we all rely on. And this is becoming more important as we move forward with the, uh, all of the comments that have made uh, earlier today and, and yesterday. Um, but the other sort of reason why this is so important, having accurate models and good measurements and, and so forth, is that there's a trade-off between a reserve margin that we carry with the grid and, and the accuracy of these models and the ability to, to conduct these contingency analysis. You know, and as, as Granger pointed out this morning, there's, there are challenges building new electrical infrastructure. So one of the objectives that we have is to squeeze more uh, capability out of our existing assets. And, and if we can do a better job of, of really understanding where the, where the edge really is in terms of the stability margin, then we can uh, relax some of those uh, reserve margins that we hold just in case uh, these bad things happen. So that's a, a really important part of squeezing more energy out of this existing infrastructure. So that's really a lot of what motivates this work. Um, I, so I'm really focused on the grid as it exists today. Um, I'm not really bringing with me uh, some of my perspectives about the, the future of the grid. Um, so uh, my focus is more on today's grid. Uh, just a quick note about where I'm from. I'm from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Washington State, as shown on the map. Uh, the National Lab System, these are the Department of Energy uh, labs in the United States, and they uh, serve kind of in between academia and industry. That's, that's our, our nature. So they're project-driven uh, research uh, projects that we have. And these uh, wide area measurements that I'm referring to, the real enabling technology was low cost, ubiquitous time synchronization. So uh, uh, GPS or, or GNSS systems are typically used for that. Um, and just in case you're wondering, yes, we are aware that there are jamming and spoofing um, vulnerabilities associated with that. And so when, when systems are really um, providing critical functionality, we need to not rely on those uh, satellite based systems for timing. But nevertheless, it's uh, widely used. Um, so these are deployed in substations, as shown in the schematic. And one of the characteristics of this type of, of data, in addition to the time synchronization, is it also provides um, a higher speed telemetry than what we would uh, historically have with, with older uh, command and control systems. But generally, it's, it's fed into the control room. It can be used for real-time or offline uh, type of applications. And just in case you're wondering, the map of North America there, and it, in, incidentally, it shows those grids nicely that I mentioned earlier in the terms of the color code. But each of those blue dots, um, it became a blue dot because it's streaming data somewhere else. So it's not just a data recorder in a substation. It actually has a real-time stream that's going out and, and going to a control center somewhere. Uh, so that, so there's, there's thousands of these now uh, today deployed in North American grid. Uh, I can kind of slip through this very quickly because phasers were previously mentioned this morning, but again, it's, it's magnitude of the, uh, in, in our case, 60 hertz, and in the case of Europe, 50 hertz grid. Uh, so the magnitude of those um, sinusoid is, is, the, is the length of that arrow, and the, and the angle is, is based on that phase relationship. And it relates to the physics of the grid and rotating machinery. But the real key of this technology that I'm talking about is when you have uh, phaser measurement units at different locations that might be separated by hundreds or more of kilometers. Um, and as long as you have the same time reference, the phase angle of those different parameters, it could be voltage or current or other types of uh, power system measurements, uh, those phase angles have very important meaning um, when you have the same time reference that you're referring them to. I'll skip over this in terms of how PMUs work. Uh, how accurate do we need to be? Um, again, this is based on 60 hertz. You can just crunch the numbers and the math of, um, you know, 60 hertz corresponds to about 46 microseconds. That would be the whole budget of error. And so typically we try to get under 10 microseconds of precision. Um, and the good news is that a, a GPS clock is, is uh, usually about one microsecond. So we're, that's about the class of accuracy we need. And that's important because you can't use 
uh, things like uh, NTP or, or LTE type of time synchronization, you, you really do need to get into something that has a microsecond class accuracy. Um, there's different types of PMUs having to do with how they're filtered in terms of protection and measurement. Uh, this emphasizes that the synchrophaser time scales multiple measurements per second. Uh, SCADA is an older telemetry system that's widely used and then smart meters and things are much slower than that. Um, so we're, we can be down in the, in the you know, multiple measurements per second is, is usually where we live. And why that's important is um, what I've done with this diagram is each of those large dots represents the, the traditional telemetry that you would have. That it, in that case, it's once every four seconds. And say your grid was in experiencing an oscillation. So this is an eigenvalue that's drifted into the right half plane. Um, and the, the, little, the little dots are, are 30 times per second. Um, and so um, you can clearly see that if you only had reference to those big dots, you wouldn't quite fully understand what's going on in the system. So you need the, the better measurements to, to do this. So the analogy I've heard before is it's like going from x-rays to MRIs. And why this is critically important, this is a case in 1996 where the grid went unstable. What's on the left is measurement data. The top right is the, it's just a close-up of that same data. Uh, so this happens to be power flow across the transmission line between the Pacific Northwest and California. And that undamped 0.3 hertz oscillation is obviously not good. The significance of this is the bottom uh, plot, the blue line. That's what the computer model predicted should have happened with the same sequence of events, the same initial condition and sequence of events. And that was put together during the blackout investigation after the fact. Clearly, we have a problem. If the, if the model is that inaccurate, we can't reliably run the grid. And that is one of the contributing causes of this particular blackout and, and led to a lot of research to use this type of measurement information to gather this data to do a better job of, of um, calibrating and validating those computer models. But we can use these uh, uh, synchrophasers for a variety of other uh, real-time or offline applications. I'll give a quick plug to the North American Synchrophaser Initiative. Even though the North America is our focus, we have had uh, presenters at our meetings from all around the world, Europe, India, China, South America. Um, so there's many, many countries that are deploying these. You know, they're all over the place. Um, and I actually quit putting these maps together because in the early days of, of NASPY, really promoting why would somebody want a, a PMU was the early focus. And so we kept track of how many there were and, and what people are using them for. Uh, now the, the research has really shifted to those three uh, dot points there, the networking, the analysis of the data, as well as high resolution uh, sensors to characterize uh, inverter-based resources. So I've got more that I'm going to talk about on the, the deep learning and, and big data analysis in a minute. So let me just uh, spend a second on the high resolution data. So as Deepak mentioned, these, these inverters, they're happening um, and, and Judd also mentioned this, they're, they're, things are happening much faster than synchronous machines. We had a case in the Western Interconnection where we had a, a normally cleared line-to-line -line fault, and during the time before the fault was cleared, uh, that line-to-line -line fault created a phase jump, and that phase jump was interpreted by the inverter controls as an over-frequency event, and so the, the inverters thought they were doing the grid a favor by coming offline or reducing their power output. That's clearly a very bad thing because we had one transmission line fault that then cascaded into a generation deficiency. So when the, when the line was, was uh, reclosed, we had, a, we had now a bunch of generation offline. So uh, that happened a few years ago. There's another event happened in Texas that was worse. And, and then a, um, a, a later event in Texas is even worse than that one. So NERC, the North American Electric Reliability Council, is very concerned about these uh, behavior of these inverters. The challenge is, is that a lot of what the synchrophasers do is, is filter out those things in terms of the transients and the really fast acting things. Uh, but we're, we've had several uh, presentations at our NASPY meetings about leveraging the, the measurement um, infrastructure to capture some of that waveform and, and point on wave type of data so we can use that to validate the behavior of the inverters on a wide scale. Um, so that's, I'm going to skip through my NASPY meetings because you know, if you want to come to an NASPY meeting, you're welcome to come. Uh, but if you want to learn more about NASPY, it's got a website, naspy.org, and all of the prior work group uh, presentations and 
and information about our four working groups and everything is uh, our test uh, teams are, are all located on the website. So I do encourage you to check it out if you're interested in, in synchrophasers. Uh, so now let me talk about uh, some of the tools of things that you can do with that data. So uh, we've developed some open source things that you can do in terms of frequency analysis, power plant model validation tools, load modeling, oscillation, baselining, different things that you can do with it. Uh, but I did want to spend a few minutes talking about some, some uh, AI, machine learning type of things. This is a project we did where it was a multivariate statistical analysis of the data looking for abnormal and unusual events. Um, and, and so it's a combination of, of, of things. Instead of just parameter exceedance, you look at how often uh, things happen in correlated to other data. And so you can find abnormal events pretty easily using that. It actually uh, was also very good at finding bad data. It, was, it became a very good bad data detector. Uh, the other um, uh, project we have underway is called the ESAM, uh, Eastern Connection Situational Awareness Monitoring System. So this is grid operators. You know, one of the benefits of this type of technology is when you share the data. About 10 years ago, we had a Western Interconnection uh, Synchrophaser data program, and, and all the utilities in the WEC uh, share their Synchrophaser data through an integrated MPLS network, um, and we're trying to accomplish the same for the Eastern Interconnection. And so data sharing is, is the most important part of wide area situation awareness, it, which incidentally was one of the root causes of the 2003 blackout that we had, was lack of that. So uh, a couple of uh, years ago, what we did for the Department of Energy is we pulled together two years of, of this uh, 30 samples per second measurement data from across uh, multiple utilities spanning all three of the U.S. interconnections. So this is representing hundreds of substation measurement points. So two years of, of hundreds of measurement points over uh, at 30 samples per second is a lot of data. But we pulled that together and awarded it to, uh, or shared it with these eight projects that were awarded uh, grants by the Department of Energy to do analysis of that data, looking for uh, applications of machine learning algorithms to find interesting artifacts in that data. And so this is a, a very interesting research. We're looking to make this same data set available to other researchers uh, going forward. And we're also um, interested in doing things to help the um, uh, power system operators better uh, use this type of data in their in their real time operations, and so those are pictures of the control room environment that we have at our at our laboratory. So I will wrap up with um, just reinforcing that this type of measurement data has been great for validating models, particularly with the dynamics associated with synch synchronous generators. And as we migrate into more uh, of these inverter based resources, we need higher data higher sampling rate data to really understand that, or maybe a blend of, of things where we can communicate the additional data that, that isn't properly reflected in the synchrophasers during, during these uh, transient events. If, if things are steady state, the synchrophasers work great. It's during transients and, and those types of um, excursions where the synchrophasers are missing data because the interesting things have been filtered out. So we'll hopefully have time at the end for questions. Yeah, it's a pleasure uh, being here uh, with all of you. Uh, so I haven't prepared uh, for a distribution system talk as is announced now two times, but uh, we agreed on uh, a presentation on artificial intelligence actually. Um, and so it's not only related to distribution, but if we have time afterwards in the dis discussion, I'm happy to explain a number of issues about the German distribution system if you're interested on that. So maybe starting uh, in the talk, I um, like to ask, uh, at least here in the uh, round um, table, who is actually using AI in daily life? So raise your hands. Who is, re who is using actually AI? So weather forecasts, uh, speech recognition, um, face recognition. So. I would say most of you, uh, I really think all of you, uh, are somehow using AI in daily life. So now imagine um, your operator of a complex power system. What do you think? Would you rely on an AI that is operating this power system autonomously? 
Well, um, if you know the security uh, KPIs that are expected, so what is a resilient power system? Um, I just had a talk yesterday about that and uh, I explained it the other way around. So a blackout is the opposite of a resilient power system. And so the grid operators are doing everything to avoid a blackout. And they are not very keen to um, go very quickly forward for artificial intelligence actually in operating the power system because they just don't know what will happen. So there is not yet an, an, a big trust on that, but we already have artificial intelligence also in power system operation, for example, with forecasting tools uh, that are used uh, for, from, I would say, decades already. And um, so what I'd like to um, tell you um, is why should we use AI in power systems? I already made a first um, impression about that. Um, I also want to give a glimpse into our competence center for cognitive energy systems. And I will give you some examples on how AI could be used in power system operation. So why should we use it? Actually, um, it really brings measurable benefits against classical methods of doing it. So we have proven that in many, many uh, examples. So two major areas is we can increase the speed of grid calculations significantly. After having trained it, we can be extremely fast. I will give an example later on. So we could operate nearer in real time with a better understanding of we should, what we should do. Uh, we can also uh, reduce significantly computational efforts uh, for coming to these results. Um, so this allows us really to, to be faster. And we also want to have better solutions uh, because if we are faster, sometimes we use uh, preciseness. So we um, can find better solutions with AI, for example, in state estimation with limited amount of measurements. I will give an example later. It is much better than classical approaches. And if we are now able to um, increase the speed of the calculations, we can also include additional information, informational content. For example, we can look at probabilistic distributions. So not only look at one scenario for a future, but we can en estimate um, the uncertainty of the future and come to a probabilistic distribution. What will what we could expect. No? Uh, a lot of things are not as simple as we look at. We can include um, more security constrained um, aspects. We can go into more time series and so on. So that allows us to bring more details and thereby better solutions. And it is also possible to solve really hard combinatorial topological problems. So uh, we have a lot, lot of switching uh, and discrete possibilities. And if we are talking about hundreds, thousands of possible um, switching states in order to have a secure switching uh, composition, um, then uh, you could imagine with a two, uh, with a power of hundreds or thousands of uh, possibilities that this is not possible um, in um, classical approaches. So that means uh, there is a lot of potential um, that is in there. However, there are challenges as I already introduced. So can we rely on the results? Um, so we need to have robust designs of it. We need to also, grid operators need to gain positive experiences for that. And something which is not really available yet is the question on how can we test algorithms that they are operating robustly, uh, correctly, and having certification for that. So this is an issue that is coming up and from my point of view, urgently necessary. And 
Then more from an engineering point of view, so if we talk uh, about an operator, um, power system operator perspective, they want to understand what is happening there. They want to know it's reproducible and uh, that they can trust on it, that they can um, hand over the control of the power system to an artificial intelligence. And uh, so there is a significant need to do it because, as we heard, the system is getting very complex. We need full automation to being able to operate it actually. And it's so complex that without AI, it's not imaginable to, to do it. So, but to implement AI, there is still a significant path we need to go there. So just a glimpse into the competence center um, of cognitive energy systems. Actually, this is a um, center we set up at, at our institute uh, to bring um, from um, interdisciplinary uh, perspectives, uh, perspectives artificial intelligence in the full value chain of, of, the, of the power system. So we were actually um, doing, so you can have a look at the homepage actually, uh, so we were running 44 spotlight projects. So in the, the use of um, artificial intelligence, new um, algorithms to bring that into, um, into an understanding how we could use it. And um, so here are three of them just mentioned, so increase the understanding of the future in forecasting by, uh, by considering probabilistic scenario forecasting and thereby also um, probabilistic um, um, state um, prediction. We also showed in, an, in the second example that it's possible to hand over um, the restoration of a power system in case it uh, is facing complex outages towards a self-learning agent who is with the many possible ways of reconfiguring it to bring it into um, a secure operation state is possible to handle it, uh, which would not be possible from an operator point of view manually anymore. And uh, we also showed that the complex arithmetical problems that are used in optimal power flow can also be solved much better uh, with, with AI. I will give um, two examples um, on, on these approaches. Uh, one is um, with regard to the state estimation. So what we have in power systems in, on the distribution level, so now I focus on the distribution level, is in Germany we have nearly no measurements. So actually knowing about the situation of those grids is at the moment very difficult. So what we could do now is we are running a lot of simulated grid states, training um, a neural network and then apply live measurements on that, looking at the estimations, the output like voltages of the um, of the buses in the grid, um, the power flows in there, and so on. And what you see in the figure on the um, upper right, you can see on the left classical methods like weighted these square methods compared to artificial neural networks, and uh, you can see the success rate um, uh, with an adequate uh, measurement estimation, uh, with a, um, uh, the state estimation, and uh, from the left to the right, we have an increasing number of measurement units, and we see that even with a few measurement units, there is even a very, very good result uh, with neural networks. And that is important at the moment because we have really nearly no measurements uh, in, in uh, the low voltage area. And um, so this is just an animated way where you show on the see on the left hand side uh, the, the measurements uh, running, and in this grid uh, we see then um, certain measurement uh, or certain estimation areas, and you can see um, gray dots and where you can see um, colored dots, and you see that it's very near to each other. So the error can be kept quite low with a. Uh, only very, very few measurement points in the system. So this is extremely 
uh, important and uh, very promising result. But I already said, without going through the um, diagrams here in detail, what we um, considered here was not only looking at the present state with the measurements, but also using um, uh, different ensembles of forecasting, so different futures that are probable, and bringing this into a state estimation, what you see on the right is a distribution, a probability distribution of the future um, state of the system here uh, with the loading of the lines. And so this is very important because we have an uncertain future here. And um, so it could be that over the next eight hours, we have a certain probability that we are going into overloading, um, into um, critical cr system states. And it's important to have a better understanding about the risks we have in the future. And this is now possible to really get also a better understanding about the risks and we need to prepare for those risks um, if we can estimate them. And um, yeah, I can skip that. So uh, another example is a very complex task actually. This is a flexibility estimation with an op a security constraint optimal power flow. So you know why it's only five uh, letters actually here. So uh, what we see here are two levels. So below we have the distribution system and the upper level is the transmission system. And now, um, as we are moving a lot of generation and flexibility towards the distribution system, the transmission system relies on flexibility from distribution. But what can a distribution system operator provide as flexibility to the transmission system operator if the flexibility also needs to be used in distribution? for congestion management. And in case we have outages in the distribution level, so if we have contingency, a line tr um, falls out, a transformer falls out, we have changing um, 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 loading situations in the grid, and this causes a reduction of the flexibility that is available. And so what we actually want to achieve is the, the, the right green area, which provides the active and reactive power flexibility that can be securely provided from distribution to transmission because the transmission system operator needs to know about a securely available flexibility because the TSO wants to use it for congestion management as well for having a secure grid operation. And so this is a quite uh, challenging task including considering the uncertainties we have. And so uh, this is just drafting that uh, we have now developed um, approaches where we can include uh, security constraints. So uh, looking at all the outages that could happen in distribution, looking also in the probability of what uh, the uh, situation would look like. So you can see here voltage levels um, with a, um, a probability distribution and we can um, include that uh, with an um, artificial neural network approach in order to come out to a um, uh, practicable, usable um, chart on what the flexibility area actually is. And what I, uh, what I want to show you here is that we have an, a, a really big increase of speed of calculating that. Um, and, uh, and we are, um, so coming to the, the point before, so we are running this now with artificial intelligence, but we are not 100% uh, certain that the results are correct because we are estimating it. But the results we are retesting with mathematical calculated correct uh, optimal power flows, though this is the post-processing, the, the results we gain at the end are estimated first with artificial intelligence and then validated with a mathematically correct calculation. And with that, we only need uh, 117 milliseconds for all of this, 
actually we are running 1,600 optimal power flows. So per power flow, we, we talk about um, only 80 microseconds actually. And if we look at a classical approach of running it with a mathematical optimal power flow, we would need 10,000 more time for calculating it. And so we see we, we can achieve with it secure results and extremely much faster. And uh, so this is just to, to highlighting what capabilities we can achieve here and um, applying that in the complex questions we need to answer. There is a, a lot of things uh, that can be uh, realized here. So um, just concluding on that, so we follow the vision on designing cognitive energy systems, so bringing intelligence into it, getting automation into it, having self-organizing in it, but it's a vision. Well, it's not yet uh, to be implemented uh, from uh, today to tomorrow. Uh, it's a process and uh, we are going the first steps. I just um, told about the, the increased speed of calculations. We can come to better solutions for estimation, for forecasting, for optimization in power systems. So there is a huge benefit from it. But we need more experience, we need more testing, we need to improve the explainability of what comes out of it and what is important is to build trust and really to rely on it being implemented in power system, but we have no other way we need to do it. Thank you. Well, if others around the table are like me, you've now got a whole lot of questions, but I think what uh, I'm going to suggest is that we move downstairs for the coffee break and that we uh, address those questions uh, in small groups down there in order to stay vaguely on time with respect to the rest of the session. Uh, for those who haven't put the two talks together, I mean, the uh, work that uh, Professor Brown just described, of course, uh, for which machine learning is a subset um, clearly is applicable to dealing with the enormous number of, uh, or the en or enormous quantity of data that, uh, uh, that the sort of uh, uh, measurement devices that Jeff Daigle uh, talked about. So uh, there, there is a obvious logical connection between these last two talks and, and actually with, with pretty much all of them.